Hi, I want to thank everyone for tuning in to this episode, episode 162 of the Immigration Lawyers Podcast, a really cool and special episode because we, would, we have one of the leading immigration attorneys in the country, a top partner at the Fragman Law Firm, uh, Mitch Wexler, is going to talk about his experience, his ideas, uh, great insight and great mentorship. So I strongly recommend everyone listen to this whole one. And he, he's such a you know open person and, and is open to mentorship and, and communication. So it's wonderful that we were able to reach out and connect with him. So stay tuned for that. Before starting, I want to let you all know a couple of different things. Oh, first of all, the sponsor of the podcast, DocuWise, has some new material they put out, a new system they put out. In particular, payment plans with law pay are now accessible. So, you know, DocuWise is a software program that JQK Immigration Law Firm uses, and they now allow payment plans. You can tell DocuWise to automatically charge your client's credit card periodically until their balance on their invoice has been paid. They have a, you know, a preview, a video of how they do that stuff. So if you have law pay, know that you can now, I'm sorry, you have law pay, yeah. And DocuWise, you could do that. If you don't have DocuWise yet, you know what to do. Uh, go to www.docuwise.com slash immigration dash lawyers dash podcast. And uh, you get 10% off the annual plan. So you know, annual plan already has a discount you get additional 10% off. So that's great. Just uh, the code for that after you go to that website is immigration lawyers podcast. So that's going to be great. I'm going to say the website again, www.docuwise.com slash immigration dash lawyers dash podcast. Check it out. I think you'll be happy with that software. I have been. Uh, another note, the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox is releasing a magazine format next uh, month. Hopefully it will be out by the end of January. Really excited about that. We have over a dozen colleagues who are contributing. So there's going to be a lot of awesome material from colleagues um, to help guide each other uh, about what we're doing. So we know, um, you know the great work we're doing and, and learning from it as well, along with all sorts of other information. Uh, if you're listening to this, I mean, this is primarily a show for other immigration lawyers, but I know a lot of paralegals listen as well. And so I'm going to create a classifieds page where you can list uh, that you're paralegal, what you have expertise in and your contact information. So if a lawyer is looking for a, a, a para assistance, um, they know who to contact. So if you're interested in being in the classifieds, obviously there's a fee. Just email me at info at immigration lawyers toolbox.com info at immigration lawyers toolbox.com. Uh, and I'll discuss that with you what the situation is. I think it'll be a hit. You're going to have uh, access to a lot of immigration lawyers. And, you know, if you want to make sure to get a copy of the magazine, please email me. And so you'll be on the list when it's published. It's going to be a lot of fun. I think it's going to be a game changer to have a trade association magazine like this with tons of information and data and, inf and everything we can, which there's stuff in there. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. It's very a creative kind of thing that I'm really enjoying doing. So look forward to that. I guess without any further ado, let's get it started. Welcome to the Immigration Lawyers Podcast, a part of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox, an education and marketing publication for the immigration law community that includes legal updates, interviews, discussions, education, and CLE material, and more. Note that the information here is for general education only and not intended as individual legal advice. The laws change frequently, so you should consult with an attorney about your specific case. For more information, please visit ImmigrationLawyersToolbox.com. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We have a wonderful podcast interview today uh, with a great immigration attorney, Mitch Wexler. Uh, Mitch and Mitchell Wexler, but uh, commonly known as Mitch. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. Mitch is a partner at Fragman. Uh, the full name, I don't know, <laughs> because everyone just calls a fragment. Uh, but uh, it's very, a very special guest to have because Mitch has a perspective that most people don't, uh, both from the volume of the, and size of the firm, um, that it just really you and a couple other people that see that perspective, uh, and also just the longevity of your career. So you've seen the ups and downs of what goes on uh, with different presidents and different administrations. So uh, I really cherish your, your viewpoint that you bring and share with us. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. I was excited uh, when when I got the uh, offer to come on. I've been uh, looking forward to doing it. You and your podcast are well known in the industry, so uh, happy to be uh, a member of the club. <laughs> Thank you so much. So <laughs> let's just get started to get to know you better. Uh, where, where, how did you get involved in immigration and, and work your way up to where you are right now? Well, well first, uh, uh, nomenclature wise, you said Mitch Mitchell, and you're right. I'm kind of branded in the monosyllabic Mitch. I'm a, yeah. I'm, I'm Mitch for sure. Not, not, not Mitchell. My mom, when she's mad at me, will call me Mitchell. So definitely, <laughs> definitely, definitely Mitch. And uh, you mentioned the name of the firm also, Fragman, Delray, Bernson and Lowy, but 
you're right. Again, it just goes by the name Fragment in the, in the marketplace. So, uh, yeah, I started in, uh, I, was, I would say the mid-80s, but it was actually in the early 80s. Um, I went to law school from 82 to 85. And during law school, I worked for a small LA office of a slightly larger New York immigration firm during law school. So I've been kind of in the, in the business since uh, 82. And when I graduated in 85, they needed their second attorney in their LA office. I didn't even have to put a resume together. I knew what a G28 and an I-130 was and an N-400. So, you know, mm-hmm. I was, I got the job. And uh, yeah, it's been an interesting ride ever since. But you're right, it has, the business and the ecosystem has changed significantly, not over only over the years, but over the decades for sure. Now, I'm sure the stuff you're seeing right now uh, in the last four years of Trump was never seen before. Uh, but was it as bad as, let's say, when Ira Ira came in in 94 and stuff and changes happened? Or it, this is just there's nothing uh, d- d- different. But um, uh, I think the impact on, on our clients, on our corporate clients is more significant. What, what happened over the last several years, um, just, you know, the, the um, more draconian adjudication standards. Uh, that actually had the adverse impact that the administration wanted. So, you know, a, a, a common story that I always tell, I do a fair bit of lobbying, is um, companies that have projects, especially IT companies or companies with significant IT departments, typically have a, a good uh, headcount of foreign nationals on one type of work visa or another. So if they can't get the people they need when they want them, where they want them, these projects, especially in, uh, in, with the, in a remote working environment, are, are very portable. Yeah. So, I mean, I have several clients and several case studies, so to speak, that they just lifted the whole project and moved it to Dublin or Tel Aviv or Johannesburg or Bangalore, stimulating those economies. So the administration could say, yeah, we're tough on immigration, but they're also tougher on the economy. Yeah. That, that aspect is like, it's, it's so easy to see that that's the, what's going to happen, but the short sidedness is incredible. Um, just for yeah. some catchphrases and some slogans to, to, for that. Um, but you mentioned uh, uh, I, I, Ira Ira and, you know, the, the 86 act and um, um, whenever there's a significant um, change or a new opportunity. So in, in 86, you know, when, uh, when that came out, what it, what it served to do was for young lawyers like myself at the time, it kind of evens the playing field. So when I just started, there wasn't, it wasn't EB2 and EB3. It was third preference and sixth preference. So when they kind of you know, re-juggled the nomenclature and, and, and kind of tweaked the eligibility requirements, all of a sudden everybody's, it's new to everybody. Everybody's on a level playing field. Me being a, maybe a, a two-year lawyer as compared to the 20-year lawyer, we're all learning it at the same time. So I think young lawyers should really, you know, embrace change yeah. because it provides an opportunity for them to become a subject matter expert as fast as, you know, the old timers. Yeah, that's so true. Fascinating. Cause I've, you know, I've, I've been in the game since for the last 10 years and I was able to develop myself and the brand and all this kind of stuff it's because so much stuff changes so rapidly. It does level the playing field, both in the marketing side and in the, the legal side. So um, it's just always fresh uh, and as stressful as it is when, something changes overnight. You got to know it. That does, it is keeps it creative too. And so it doesn't get boring that way. Same old stuff over and over again. That's right. Now we had a decision uh, just yesterday, day before uh, this recording uh, where a district court uh, overruled the, the H one B changes and the wage levels and stuff. So that's some good news. We'll see what happens. Uh, we also have the public charge. Uh, how, I mean, with the, with the numbers you have to the extent that you could talk about it, like, do these decisions really affect you guys dramatically? Like it's like whole shifts that happen? Uh, yeah. I mean, we put whole programs on hold and stop and start them. And, you know, the clients get dizzy. So on the public charge, since it was stopping and starting in different states, stopping and starting, um, we, we sat down with our clients and discussed what actually is going to be in their best interest. Um, since it's unpredictable and it's probably going to change again in the future, do they want to risk filing an application without the additional 944 yeah. paperwork and get a, get a kickback and just delay the whole process in the case, or just assume that it's going to come full circle and it's going to be required at some point in time during their adjudication. So many of our clients are, you know, opted for that approach. 
but uh, yeah, it's very um, confusing to, to clients and just the unpredictability of it is, is, is really tough to manage. Now, other than sending out like a newsletter or a mass email, how much direct communication do they require? All of a sudden, are you on the phone like all day, just number after number explaining this over and over again? Or do you have like a seminar? Yeah, yeah no, we usually do it on an individual client by client basis. Um, occasionally we'll, we'll put on a, 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 a seminar if there's something, you know, significant or revolutionary in, in the field that's going to last for a long time, that has a longer shelf life. But if we think, you know, something just came down yesterday, it might change next week. It's really no time for a, a, a webinar or a seminar. But it's important um, in our business, ours, yours, mine, and all, all of business uh, immigration lawyers to really um, develop and maintain the professional relationship with your contacts within your employer clientele. So for that reason, more than any other, we'd like to, to really take a personal approach and me or the, the partner who's managing that account um, will we'll schedule a phone call and kind of go through it with whoever the decision makers are on, on that side. And they really appreciate that, that um, personal touch. We don't want to be seen as very transactional um, They'll only hear from us when they initiate an H-1B case or when the labor certification gets approved and we're going to launch the I-140, for example. Mm -hmm. We want to be seen as value-added business partners. Um, so whenever there's something relevant to their program, we like to proactively reach out to them, get them on the phone. If there's no pandemic and if they're local, we'll, we'll, we'll go sit down with them and, and give them the face time that they deserve. So all from a PR, from a marketing uh, perspective, and just a client relation perspective, uh, we take that kind of stuff very seriously. It's so meaningful for clients, just that direct communication. Uh, some people think it's it's not a big deal or something, but that's like, sometimes you can charge whatever you want with fees, as long as you have that one-on-one, -on -one, that's what people want and, and care about. Yeah, and, and it's kind of assumed that um, uh, you're a competent attorney, so they could find a competent attorney elsewhere. Yeah. So it's kind of the, the, the value added things that we provide or we like to provide, you know, in between engagements, in between case initiations that really differentiate us. So we're not the type of firm that if there's some, if we want to get on a phone call with them, we're not going to turn over the hourglass and, and charge them. Yeah. So it, it's all in the name of uh, developing and enhancing um, the relationship with the client. It feels like it's unique to immigration law where we don't nickel and dime people when it comes to these phone calls and stuff. Other areas of law, it seems like they count the seconds. Yeah, <laughs> especially when they bill by the hour or by the in six minute increments. You're right. And sometimes that plays to our advantage and many times it plays to our disadvantage. Yeah. I mean, what, what we've done to ourselves is we've become very um, commoditized. Yeah. So, you know, for those that are laser focused on price and they don't care about, you know, quality and what our approval statistics are, et cetera, they just compare the cost of the widget. You know, yeah. Wexler, what do you charge? Smith, what do you charge? Interesting story, John. I was on, uh, we, we respond to a lot of uh, RFPs, requests for proposals for some larger engagements. And one years ago, it came down to what's called a reverse Dutch auction. And it's, it is as terrible as it sounds. <laughs> so picture this in, in real time. So I'm, I'm on my computer, you know, attorney Smith is on his computer, attorney Jones is on her computer and they just go down the uh, list of case types. Okay. Well, so why do you charge for H1B? I type it in. Jones types in a smaller number. Smith types in a smaller number. So it's like a race to the bottom. So I said, yeah. I'm out. <laughs> but I mean, that's the extent to which our, what we did to ourselves in yeah. commoditizing our industry. So it's important to really define scope. So another, you know, best practice to young practitioners, just to make sure that clients and potential clients are comparing apples to apples. Yeah. You know, my, my fee may, may be a little higher. It's often less, but it may be a little higher, but you know, it's, it's you're not going to get an extra bill for that phone call for yeah. the, you know, to making inquiry to the, to the agency. Um, so it's important to define scope to, to your clients is a, is a good tip. Yeah, that, that practice management tip is so key. Uh, it's detail, like even every form you're going to submit, especially because, they change forms all of a sudden a DS5540 comes in player I944 and they'll say, well, you know, just do it. You're like, well, that was not particularly listed in, in, in the work because that could add hours and hours of work. Um, but okay. with regards to the, the pricing situation, uh, it, so you were watching what the other colleagues were saying, you could see what the other people were posting. Yeah. 
<laughs> in a situation like that, you kind of at the beginning be like, I don't want, because people will contact me, uh, emails and stuff. And I just say, you have to have a full consultation. Then we'll talk about fees. I, I don't even bother talking to somebody at, just at call it for fees. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, when you have a lot of people on the team, you can't just disregard people. For me, it's easy because I'm solo and I don't need that many cases just to have a lifestyle mm-hmm. kind of firm. But uh, is it hard or do you want to just say, I don't want to do this? Just go somewhere? Yeah, well, we don't respond to every RFP because many times it's kind of a fishing expedition. Yeah. They're, 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 they're happy with their current provider. They just want to make sure they're not getting ripped off. Yeah. <laughs> so, so they go out to market. But in this case, it was very competitive with a bunch of firms. And uh, they uh, uh, whittled it down to about three who got invited to this reverse Dutch, Dutch okay. auction. So it's kind of late to get off the train. But but certain case types, I, I just said, you know, I'm out. I, I'll, I'll, I'll lose money at that rate. So. so would they have gone around and picked different firms for different case types? Do you have clients? No. Because that makes sense. Uh, you got to pick yeah. one firm. For yeah, they wouldn't have done that. Yeah. So they, they would have to settle on one. If, if Jones is a little higher on, on, on one or two case types, but a lot lower on many more, yeah. and they were uh, uh, primarily price sensitive, you know, mm-hmm. she would get the nod. But, uh, but um, I must say that although price is very important to, to everybody, oftentimes it's not the driving factor. I mean, nobody wants to get ripped off. Mm-hmm. So as long as you're within range, um, there are other uh, factors that um, at least larger corporate clients with bigger immigration programs are uh, value more, yeah. like technology, um, reporting capability. You know, they want to be able to press a button and get like a, a readout of all their cases and mm-hmm. when, when certain foreign nationals are expiring. If a certain program comes out for a certain nationality, they want our technology to have the ability to report on nationality, press a button, and let's see everybody born in, in India for example, oh, interesting. Or, or for, you know, or priority dates before this, this particular date. So big programs are more interested in stuff like that. Speaking of priority dates, uh, how was the last, how's the last two months been with the uh, data filing dates for employment base and the visa? Yeah. Board? October was a, uh, was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was, uh, it was actually, um, I was just talking to somebody about it. It was, you know, a, a challenging year for many of us. Um, but October really accelerated a lot of a lot of work, and it was quite a challenge to be able to deliver a huge volume of these AOS filings within 30 days because we didn't know it was still going to be open in November. So we committed to our clients to get everything filed within the, the calendar month of October. So, yeah, we hired all kinds of temps, and we, we utilized our back office in Kochi, India, and we, we, our technology group, our IT group put together kind of a, a toolkit for us to help us um, put together these uh, AOS cases in a, in a more expedited fashion. So yeah, it was, um, but what it did really, and a lot of immigration lawyers, you know, didn't at least initially think about it is, it's really not additional business, it's not new business, it kind of, it's cannibalizing future business. Yeah. These people, their priority date eventually would have been current and maybe in a year or two or three, you would have prepared and built for that AOS case, but it, it all came to a head and, and created that October spike. But yeah, I've never seen something like that in, uh, what is it, 35 years or so that I've been doing this. I mean, there's always been programs and opportunities like that and, and, and deadlines, but I've, I've never seen anything on, on that scale before. How do you how do you run this ship? Because you guys have a lot of attorneys there. How many how many associates and attorneys total does your firm have? Uh, we're about a little over six hundred uh, worldwide. A uh, little over a hundred partners, maybe one hundred ten partners, but five thousand employees. So our leverage is is pretty good. We have um, a, a tiered structure in our paralegal uh, core. So we have some paralegals that have been with us, you know, 35 years, 25 years that know more than many of the attorneys and they're the go-to people and they're highly compensated and they're extremely knowledgeable. So we're broken up into teams, um, either according to, to, and the different offices do it slightly different, but in my region in Southern California, because I oversee LA, Irvine and San Diego, um, we're kind of broken out into teams based on uh, use, typically client size because the process is similar for similar programs. All the teams are creating the same widget or hot dog that comes out of the, the, the processor, mm-hmm. but the process itself is very different if it's a large, sophisticated program. We have a, 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 
a kind of a, a small individual case unit, we call it the ICU, it's an individual case unit that um, represents smaller companies that may be doing the first H-1B, maybe doing a naturalization case, maybe an EB-5 case, a national interest waiver, some more individualized stuff that requires more handholding and more explaining. So it's, it, it requires a lot more, it's, it's more time consuming to execute those types of cases. So the process is very different. So we try to bundle those case types together. So at least they get efficient at executing an inefficient case. Yeah. <laughs> See? And how do you deal with a company that comes in and they might be in the same field with an existing company you have? There's no conflict of interest per se because it's different companies, but do they ever say, I want to know who your client lists are that are competitors or something like that, which might be confidential? Uh, yeah, they do. Um, and uh, we represent a lot of clients in the, in the same industry mm -hmm. and we let them know there's pros and cons to it. I mean, there's good benchmarking uh, intel that you're going to be able to get without us mentioning specific clients that they want to know in the semiconductor field, you know, are they sponsoring, uh, are, are most companies sponsoring green cards as soon as they land with an H-1B or are they waiting six months or a year, you know, things like that. Yeah. So, you know, the ability to accurately and meaningfully benchmark is, is important. So they make a decision if they, we're not gonna mention specific clients to them, but if they feel there might be a conflict, they, they just won't hire us. We're, we're okay a, with that. I mean, if they knew, like, it's a good thing, because if you start seeing certain RFEs in a certain field that just pop up out of nowhere, um, mm -hmm. you could really quickly adjust and, and, you know, fix up other stuff down the line. So it is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we monitor, we, we monitor all that. We, we have a group on the East Coast that whenever an RFE comes in or wherever some kind of wacky you know, off the wall adjudication comes in, we feed it into this group and they log it in. And it's kind of like a mini ALA that, that we have. And uh, so we're able to identify trends pretty quickly, which is a real good yeah, it's very powerful. value add, value add to, our, to our clients. Yeah. And we know like which office and number, you know, at, at the service centers, to, you know, who, who's the problem. Yeah. So we got to share know, that with everybody. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, there's a, there's a premium processing uh, person. That's a, a bit of a problem at, at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I, I, I imagine. <laughs> so, so that's, that's valuable information. So, you know, yeah. maybe, although it might be a case type that's eligible for premium processing, maybe for that type of reason, due to the uh, Intel that we have, we might uh, recommend let's not premium pro uh, process yeah. it, let it take its normal course and you'll, you'll get a fair adjudicator. And, you know, so much immigration law isn't even a law. It's about how they're looking at things at the time or which service they're sending it to because of the huge disparity, uh, discrepancy uh, that happens between them. Uh, but which, which direction are you, is your firm going now? Because I know you, you guys bought Simple Citizen, which was a software that helped people analyze their case themselves. Uh, just more global expansion or more just U.S. market? What, what directions are you guys going to? Uh, well, we're very focused on technology right now, which prompted the Simple Citizen um, acquisition. Mm -hmm. So we're, um, we're uh, uh, building up their uh, forces to uh, accommodate our scale. Um, you're right, they, they entered the market as kind of a DIY shop, and they're still going to have that component to it. And we're probably still going to offer that to, to some case types, maybe a marriage case or a Nats case. Yeah. case. You could either do that or, or if, if you don't want to do it yourself, you could do it the traditional way through, through our law firm. But um, yeah, we're really uh, uh, laser focused on uh, technology and just getting more uh, efficient, utilizing um, AI, because we find ourselves as, as you and, and many others uh, doing just the same repetitive functions and it really lends itself to, to AI. I mean, if we prepare a foreign national for an L1 interview at a consulate, you know, it'll take 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And with some large multinational clients, there's, you know, many per month. So that same attorney is sitting there, you know, you could just press play on the tape recorder, really. So we said, yeah, let's press play on the tape recorder. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, we have these power tunes now that, that kind of go through exactly what the attorney would go through. So save the attorney time. And if they still want uh, a call with a live warm body, we'll do that, but it'll probably be a shorter call. So it's a, it's, it's a win-win really. So that, that's the kind of stuff we're focusing on. But as far as firm growth, um, uh, always looking to increase market share both in and out of the United States. Um, there's uh, a, a lot of um, green pastures uh, out of the United States. So our most um, um, 
uh, recent office openings gonna uh, gonna be probably in a month or so in in the Netherlands. So whenever our corporate clients start sending people to a particular jurisdiction that we don't have an office in, as soon as it kind of reaches critical mass, we say to ourselves, okay, it, it makes sense now yeah. to, to just launch our own. So we'll hire the best best in breed in that particular country, fragmentize them, we'll let them you know go to um, uh, uh, training on our technology, our culture, our client service ethos, and then it's a it's a new fragment office. So that's, that's kind of how we expand. That's very interesting. Um, are there any like do, do, is is immigration the same globally? Do you know where like in the U.S. it's either a solo game and then there's a couple of big few players. Um, but uh, overseas, I know some accounting firms are getting involved and stuff like that. But are there any like local firms like in the Netherlands or in Australia that do the, like that have this kind of scope or power to, to do large numbers? Uh, yeah, every country on, on a different scale. I mean, no one on, on, on the scale of a U.S. practice. Yeah. But, you know, Australia has a dominant practice and the U.K. has a dominant practice. And it's usually us at, at this point in time, but not always. Yeah. Um, but like the U.S. also, there's a lot of um, uh, smaller, really uh, uh, good practitioners. Yeah. And those are the ones that, that we like uh, to target to bring into our fold. But every, uh, every country, yeah, has, you know, the small, medium and, and large players, depending on the size and attractiveness of, of, of the market. If it's, a, if it's a small pool, it doesn't really lend yeah. itself to creating large yeah. providers. I've talked to attorneys in certain countries that are immigration lawyers, but they have to do it like part time because there's just not that much demand, like in Czech or something like that. I was talking to an attorney right. there a couple months ago. Uh, yeah, yeah, a lot, a lot of labor lawyers. Our, yeah. um, matter, as a matter of fact, our partner who runs our Costa Rica office used to be an employment lawyer in Costa Rica and then got his first immigration case. And then the tide shifted. Then he found himself, you know, he was effective. He got a good reputation. And then immigration became, you know, 90% of what he was doing instead of 10%, like two years prior. So wow. he's, he's now 100% an immigration lawyer. So that's, that's a common path as well. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of high net worth Americans are searching for that second passport. I'm not sure how big the volume is, but that's something always when it pops up in the news, I'll see that the former CEO of Google got a, a Cyprus uh, passport. Yeah, so right. like we're going to Panama, South America for alternatives and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And St. Kitts. I mean, you always hear about that because uh, I had clients who sometimes get some of those passports for the E2 purposes um, so they could, when their home country doesn't have it. But that's always right. an interesting thing to get into. Yeah, we, we see some uh, Indians showing interest in it they're not signing up in mass yeah. by any means but it's it's always a conversation that they feel good exploring even yeah. if they ultimately reject it but we have um what's called a private client practice worldwide at, at fragment so i'm very active in it our group in london our group in new york and miami so several of us are, are very active in the private client and it's usually catering to high net worth foreign nationals um, we do a lot of eb5 in different countries versions of EB-5 uh, for this particular market. So that we see that as a big growth area as, as well because yeah. of the second passport need that you mentioned. Yeah, the EB-5 program for other countries, the investor programs are much easier. Like I was talking to a, he's not an attorney, but he's an agent for Luxembourg where it's so much more easier to get a, like an EB-2 with there or investment or, or, or EU in general, like in Spain was having programs where you like buy a place recently, Turkey, uh, they're saying, I've just heard people say it, but like you just buy a house in Turkey and get citizenship for there, which is an E2 country. So it's mm -hmm. pretty magical if we could pull that off. Yeah, different countries have different programs. And by far, the EB-5 is the most complicated and uh, <laughs> uh, longest waiting period, depending on the country you're from and the riskiest. Yeah. It's got some challenges that hopefully the uh, the next administration will clean up a little bit to make it a little more appealing. Because if you think about it, it's really a win-win. It doesn't cost the taxpayers anything. It creates jobs. It brings in significant capital into the U.S. You know, it's 900K now. It used to be 500K. Um, so it should be a no-brainer, but it's uh, it's not yet. Yeah. Now, you mentioned at the beginning uh, about uh, some lobbying that you do. Uh, I'm somewhat interested, especially if listeners could help you with that, so if you need to sign stuff and stuff. Uh, what kind of stuff? I mean, obviously, there's, um, you know, articles you write for newspapers, you contact local Congress people, something everyone should do. Um, but there's stuff that other listeners could help you with because we all have the same interest here, which is, you know, help the movement of people in a lawful, in a lawful method. Yeah, I think... Um especially when I speak to uh, media, which I do fairly often, they're always asking me if they can, uh, if there's a client willing to speak to them. 
and it's and it's yeah. usually the answer is no. Nobody wants to kind of you know poke their head out to be chopped off. Yeah. Um, but if anybody's aware of you know a particular either a company or even a foreign national that might be experiencing some hardship as a result of the news of the day, if there's some you know H one B hardship news coming out, and there's an uh, there's uh, an, an H one B visa holder that's willing to talk, that could only help. That makes the article a little more compelling. And, uh, you know, people read these articles. I get those emails too. And also get uh, the show 90 Day Fiance. They contact yeah. me with 90 Fiance visas. And I'm oh, like, do they? Yeah, they haven't yeah, contacted me. That's an interesting show. <laughs> it's too risky, but it's a good show. <laughs> and it's interesting is the people on the show are usually have wild stories. But what I found the fiance visas, people think it's fake. But like, no, a lot of times that's a situation for these fiance visas. <laughs> like, yeah. If there's discrepancy, yeah. there's weird stuff going on, but they're in love. It's just how the way love works. <laughs> Yeah, in some of those episodes, I've, uh, um, I'm embarrassed to say I've, I've watched it. Uh, it's going the other way. So it's the American, you know, yeah. living in Ethiopia or Delhi or, 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 or somewhere. Those are always interesting, too. But yeah, the, the, the fiancé visa is kind of interesting because um, although we, we, we do a bunch of it, you know, once I go through the options with a particular client, it's probably going to take as long just to get an immigrant visa. You know, if they yeah. can't come in, you know, marry in some third country, if you're going to get married anyway, you know, it's, I tell them, listen, it's one case to pay me for instead of two cases. And yeah. so it's usually a little more efficient that, that way. But sometimes, it, it, you know, the facts just don't accommodate it. Yeah, exactly. That's so we make it work. I rarely would want someone to do it. I always try to talk them out of it. I have like some same sex couples who can't get married anywhere. They can't get a visa to come to the U.S., get married. Or some of one client who wants to have the wedding here um, just because their family's here. I'm like, as you said, it's two cases, essentially doing all the cases, like a marriage case and a fiance and a non immigrant visa case at the same time. There's no point in doing that. And the time you save is minuscule, uh, relatively. And then you come here and you gotta, you can't get a work permit. You have to wait <laughs> six months to get a work permit. So that fine. I've had so many clients come here and then not have the work permit, and then they get into fights and because they're not making money or they're home all day. So I always, I always tell them about that. I'm like, you don't really want a fiance visa. It's not that much better. Um, this probably yeah. works off there. Mar- marriage is tough enough yeah. to, 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 to navigate through with, with you know, two Americans. <laughs> now, how has how marketing changed since uh, you started? I mean, you, you worked at Ferns, you had partners, but um, ha- have you seen a shift in how clients reach out to you? I, I guess big corporations, business to business, probably the same one-on-one, maybe conferences, but have you seen a mm-hmm. shift in how business development works uh, from the 90s till now? Uh, actually, uh, less uh, uh, evolution in that regard than, than you might think. Yeah. I mean, it's always been my my undergrad degree was in marketing. Um, and I always tell people it's kind of my passion. So I always tell people I use that degree more than my law degree every day just because I enjoy it so much. I, yeah. I, um, but it's uh, I, and I do it pretty old school, but now in kind of an, a, a newer school kind of way, I'm not as uh, a, a social media uh, uh, an expert as, as you are. But, um, you know, I try to stay active and keep a good presence on on social media. But there's really nothing like um, physical networking, which is impossible to do during a pandemic. But me and and all of uh, my attorneys in in the region, we're we're all really encouraged um, to get out there, you know, get out of the office. We know you're you're really busy and you don't have time, but make time. Um, So just, you know, getting involved in different uh, associations and and, and not even in a disingenuous way, the way I, I sit with most of my attorneys and put together individual business development plans. So when I sit with my younger attorneys, I say, don't do anything that you're not comfortable doing. You know, you, you have to be genuine and, and authentic. So I, I say, what are your hobbies? Do you play golf? Do you, do you fish? Do you play tennis? You know, uh, join a golf club, join a, a tennis club, and then, you know, be known as the immigration lawyer in that group. Yeah. And eventually someone's going to someone's gonna need you. Mm-hmm. And then it just kind of proliferates. Yeah. Um, you know, if you're the, the coach of your daughter's soccer team, that's, that's good too. You know, when you're on the sidelines, everyone asks me, what kind of work do you do kind of thing. Um, but it's interesting that um, I encourage my uh, attorneys to get out there and um, not only uh, mingle with immigration attorneys, which is incredibly valuable, like ALA meetings and local immigration section of bar association meetings, but get out there where immigration lawyers aren't, right? You're not going to pick up a client at an ALA meeting. Yeah. So, you know, you want to be, you know, you want to become the the go-to immigration resource for, for your, for your network. So in my office, 
we have by now, you know, generations of lawyers. We have lawyers in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. I just turned 60. So each each one of of those age segments, um, I want my attorneys to be the go-to resource. So if you're in your your 20s, you're just kind of fine-tuning your, your, your craft. You, you, so there's not much of a business development expectation, but you want to make sure that all your law school friends, all your undergrad friends know that you're an immigration lawyer yeah. and you become the go-to resource for your age bracket. And then the decision makers are getting younger and younger in these client companies. Very rarely are they my age. They're, they're probably in their thirties and forties now. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to have effective communicators uh, who appears to those people. So we try to, you know, uh, uh, striate the, uh, the, the, the market penetration, so to speak. You know, what, what makes it kind of hard and where we're at is uh, just the amount of traffic there is for in-person stuff. I remember Blake Miller, uh, who's at Fragment of Irvine, um, he would come to downtown meetings. And I was like, wow, I can't believe you went through that traffic just to get to L.A. It seems like yeah. those areas, it's so hard with the traffic to do it. That's right. Stuff. Yeah, especially when he was chair a few years ago. So, yeah, yeah he, he had to endure it. When I go to the downtown L.A. office, I take the train. Yeah. <laughs> Amtrak, that's definitely the way to go. <laughs> for sure. So, you know, that kind of fed into our next question was what advice you have for people starting out? Because that, that was like some excellent advice right there. Is there anything else like if someone just getting into immigration law or starting their own firm um, that would help them out? Both maybe we talked about the business side, maybe educational wise too. Mm -hmm. Well, if I harken back to when I started my own uh, practice in 89, I remember January 89. So I was uh, an, a young associate in a small firm for, I don't know, three or four years or so. And even after the first year, I was asking myself, you know, Mitch, do you know enough to go out on, on your own? And I finally, after three or four years, I, I thought I, I, I knew the critical mass of information not to be laughed at when a, when a client called me. Um, so I had a mentor. So it's very important, I think, for young attorneys uh, who are either going out on their own or even with a firm that they're very happy at that just wants to grow within the ranks of that firm to have a mentor you know, a trusted advisor. So I had one. And I remember uh, uh, driving to his house in Encino. We're having a coffee in his living room. Might have been a beer, but let's let's stick with coffee for now. Um, and he um, and I said, you know, I just, you know, I'm not sure, you know, if, if, if I know enough, if I'm going to have all the answers. And he said, Mitch, you're never going to have all the answers. He says, I don't have all the answers. He said, Mitch, I have a question for you. When you open up your, your new office, are you going to have a chair? Yes. Are you going to have a desk? Yes. Are you going to have a phone? Yes. He said, call me. I said, all right. I gave notice two weeks later. And here we are talking to John Kuzravi <laughs> <laughs> on a podcast. Yada, yada, yada. <laughs> How did you find that mentor? That's, that's a hard, it's hard for some people. To find. It's, it's, yeah, it is, especially during the pandemic. But back in the day, there was a lot more physical interaction among immigration attorneys because I was in L.A. at the time. And believe it or not, they had what was called Attorney Day every Wednesday. If there's any old timers on, on, online, they'll, they'll remember this. So on Wednesday, the district office was closed to the general public, only open to attorneys to make inquiries up on the eighth floor, file cases on, on the first floor. So we would have like big bags full of our cases. You get you queue up in line. There were line standers, professional line standers who would queue up like two in the morning with thermoses of coffee. So I'd show up like, you know, six in the morning, I give him a $20 bill, he'd leave. So finally my ticket gets called and you could file up to five cases. So you're waiting there hours to get your ticket called at, at the bakery, so to speak. So you're just schmoozing with all these attorneys. I was, a, I was in law school at the time when I started doing this. So that's where I met my mentor. So finally my number gets called, I, I get called up to the counter and believe it or not, they would adjudicate these cases right, up, right over, over the counter, a marriage case, um, an H-1B case, you hand over the 129. There's no H supplement at the time. There's no prevailing wage. There's no LCA. You just hand them the 129 and they stamp it, give you an I-94 and you, and you go home and you're a hero. So that provided the environment to really meet and schmooze and get to know your peers. Right now, young lawyers really don't have much of that. You can go to a, a marriage interview or a Nats interview and you can hang out at the district, district office but it's, it's definitely not the same. It's, it's much harder. So at going to bar association meetings, ALA meetings, uh, immigration section meetings at the LA County Bar, Orange County Bar, wherever you are. Yeah, I, I've met a lot of people at the LA, uh, so SoCal ALA meetings and, and talking with them, but 
one trick I did was creating this podcast because it people would come on the show and it kind of forces a friendship because you're talking for an hour <laughs> automatically. Yeah. Uh, they, they become you know mentors, friends, and 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 people that and just like I, I got to reach out to you and we had talked by email in the past. I remember, but on mm-hmm. um, this yeah, yeah. helps bring it to the next level. Uh, now, not everyone's yeah. gonna do a podcast, but I, the podcast has been just a magical experience, uh, like to do. And actually, I yeah. know Fragment just started a podcast uh, recently as well. It's popping up on on iTunes. I've seen. Yeah, they asked me to do a, a vlog, like a video blog on on EB five. So I'm I'm kind of outlining that right now. So I'm gonna stay tuned for that. Wonderful. Uh, you know, you mentioned how it was back in 80s and 90s. I remember I worked uh, for a solo practitioner who was around the same times and he would talk about how it used to be, we had to go and go there and get the forms. Like you can't just go in online and download it. What was your yeah. question? Like there's, there's pros and cons. I mean, the cons were the waiting in the line, but the pros yeah. were you get to know the officers and, you know, you yeah. can work stuff out with them, it seemed. And that's why they got rid of it, I assume, because of the yeah. friendly relationship. Yeah. And it was just, then the service center came on into existence. There was, there was no California service center at the time mm-hmm. or there was, but they, they uh, no, it, it, it wasn't in existence at, at that point in time. But, you know, speaking of the forms, it's interesting because they limited the forms to five of each. So I remember my boss at the time sent me to the um, Santa Ana. So I'm living and working in LA. He says, go to the Santa Ana sub office because they have a whole wall full of forms and they're less strict you know, fill up your, fill up your bag of I-130s and I-140s. And so, you know, I walk in there, I take five of each, you know, I look around, I leave, I go back to my car, I kind of take my tie off, take the jacket off, go in, take it, <laughs> put a fake nose and glasses on. <laughs> so I came back, you know, scored a bunch of forms. I was a hero. Yeah, you mentioned the California <laughs> Service Center. Um, do you, do you know if there is any extra uh, FDNS or, or site visits for H-1Bs and the L1s because we're closer to that office uh, or they, they, they just spread those out? Do, do you have any info on that? Because my clients are here. I'm like, are we getting more than the average just because we're closer and it's easy for them to come to us? Yeah, I haven't put that, uh, put that together to uh, identify a trend like that. Because they they usually they contract that out and and they could they can spread them out wherever they want, but uh, now that you mention it, I'll I'll see if anybody, uh, or I'll see if our group that I mentioned earlier has seen a trend around uh, around different uh, service centers. I have a Inter- client interesting thing to look at. So I, I like every time we do L renewal, I work, I like make sure he has everything in order. Cause I'm like, you're right there. They could just drive by for lunch and they come. <laughs> so you gotta be really prepared. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll look into that. So now, now onto a positive and negative side, what is, what is some of your favorite stuff or favorite thing about being an immigration lawyer and one of the things you dislike the most? Uh, well, what I, what I do like a lot is there's, um, it's adversarial, but the, the adversary is not a, a, another person. It's not like a, um, you know, a, a divorce practice where yeah. there's like screaming people in your waiting room and it's, it's, it could be miserable. I couldn't deal with that. So there is obviously an adversary. It's an institutional adversary, but it's really the result of what we do, what you do, what I do, what many of us do is not only helping families, but um, businesses and companies. And we really change lives of, of, of people. Um, I'm probably the godfather of maybe a half a dozen kids of my clients over the years. So you get the opportunity really to develop these personal relationships. I've been to weddings in Mumbai and Johannesburg. And so I really like the, the personal touch. I don't, um, I don't take it for granted really. So it, it's harder to develop that on, on an institutional level, on a big corporate client level. Mm-hmm. So more of that private client practice that I was mentioning earlier, when you really work extensively and intimately with a family. Yeah. So this wedding in Mumbai was the daughter of an EB-5 client. So I went there about two years ago to attend this wedding. It was one of these you know, four or five day weddings and I had a different Indian outfit for each one. It was, it was, it was great. It's so, so memorable. I took my daughter with me. So, you know, she's still talking about it. So it's, it's the, the ability really to establish and maintain those relationships that that's, that's really meaningful to me. Yeah. It's so personal. And you, you get to see your work in the news, even like I've, I've had so many clients where I'm like, Oh, they're on a billboard. They're in the news. You're really literally shaping America, especially on your end. You probably, every day see the effect of your work, how it's like really sculpting how America is. 
Yeah, yeah. And um, even on the corporate side is very gratifying. You know, when there's a, when one of our corporate clients makes a, a major acquisition, uh, immigration, uh, we always train them to make sure that immigration issues get on your due diligence checklist. Yeah. We've had so many bad experiences where they contact us, you know, on the 11th hour, <laughs> the deal's closing tomorrow. And what do you know, the CEO is on an H-1B visa. She can't go to work tomorrow. So we've been pretty good at educating our clients to get immigration on the due diligence checklist. So once once they do, and we really uh, put together a strategy and execute it, and everybody has employment authorization on the day the, the deal closes, mm-hmm. it's a... Uh, it's, it's gratifying being part of that kind of big team, working with corporate counsel, securities counsel. So even on the, on the corporate side, it's, it, it could be very gratifying. One thing is they always put, I'm glad you put on their checklist because they put immigration last as a afterthought. And if at all. Yeah, L1s where the relationship ends and they're like, oh, by the way, we did merge that, you know, more direct relationship to the company. It's like, oh no, why did you tell me this? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. many times ease, evaporate, you know, you lose nationality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, it's I, I didn't talk about the negative part. That could be pretty much. That it could be it. <laughs> like it just, there's so many small things you have to be careful about. Is this person's passport have six months left on it or not? Or are they like? It's just so many little details you have to pay attention to in immigration. That's like it's a huge negative. <laughs> it's quite against this law. Yeah, yeah it, it's 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 true. It's very unforgiving, especially some like the you know the perm form. If you check off the wrong box or something, it's just you know un, yeah. unforgiving. Some some things are fixable and and many things aren't. So it's really detail oriented. So, you know, we, we build in several levels of review before anything goes out. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it happens. I mean, especially with perm, like people have like four levels of review, but some typo comes in there, some mistake comes, someone, no one catches it. And it's, it's so unforgiving. It sucks that they've made it so difficult like that. It's, is there a reason why they're so strict on, on that stuff? Or is it just, is no, no good reason. It's uh, I can't think of a policy reason or a rationale. It's mm-hmm. yeah. I, I, I don't know. Yeah, and then they do things like on the, the DS 260 for consular, they don't have an API system so that it can automatically populate. You have to go through the, the whole thing over again. It, it's so obnoxious. To, it's such a time waste to, for those kind of things that could simply be made easier. Yeah. And, and with uh, labor search, all that kind of stuff too. Um, I have a colleague, uh, Roman Zelchenko, who has this com- company called Laborless for Perm Advertising. It's just that he always you know, talks about they don't make it easy for you that's unnecessarily. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Mitch, uh, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, if people want to reach out to you, get to know you, what's the best place to, to find you on yeah. your website, but any other social media or anything like that? Yeah, yeah. Either you know, send me an email directly, mwexler at Fragman uh, is a good way. Um, I have a decent presence on, on LinkedIn. Send me, send me a message, friend me. Um, yeah. Always looking to uh, uh, mentor. If there's any younger attorneys there that, uh, that might find value in picking my brain. I'm happy. Any old timers I want to talk about the, the good old days or the bad old days. I'm happy to, I'm happy to reminisce about that as well. Let's think about battle days. How, how are you viewing the future with a new administration? Uh, is there any plan that could be done yet? Because there's so many unknowns or are there any plans that you're making yet? Yeah, it's, uh, it's funny. I'm, I'm speaking at a conference in, um, uh, next week. It's uh, an EB-5 oriented conference, but my panel is on the potential impact of a Biden administration on EB-5. And there's really not, not much known, not much to talk about, but at least, um, um, I think some of the draconian adjudication standards eventually will calm down a little bit. I think a Biden administration will be a little more immigration friendly, even business immigration friendly. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it'll depend on, on, on all the appointments. It looks like Mayorkas is going to come back, which is probably good news. And we'll see who the next tier of uh, appointees are in the relevant agencies, Homeland Security, state, you know, CIS. Uh, but we're, cautiously uh, optimistic that things eventually will get a little better for our clients. You know, and we just had uh, the Senate pass the employment-based update to kind of take away uh, country of origin uh, quotas. We'll yeah, see S- S-836 or something like that yesterday, yeah. right? Yeah, so that that's interesting too. So that the Senate just passed it, so it's going back to the House. And the, the Senate version is very different than the version that, that got sent to them from the House. So if and when the house is able to reconcile it, it'll go back to the Senate and then for signature. And if all that doesn't happen before the end of this month, it just evaporates. So I think that that concept has been talked about for quite a long time. So if it, 
goes away because of, of timeliness. Uh, in one form or another, we, we think that it'll get taken up again, whether it's yeah. six months down the road or 12 months down the road. And I say in one form or another, because it's either to do away with, with per country limits or such other uh, um, uh, vehicles to achieve that objective, like not counting family members. Yeah. I mean, that would be huge. That's a, you know? th- that's the one that they just got to do because the statute was so unclear on that, taking rid of uh, derivatives county as visa numbers, especially for yeah. EB-5. I mean, all these poor Chinese people. Especially EB-5, like- yeah. Because it, it's, it, it, the statute says, you know, 10,000 investors, but they're not counting 10,000 investors. Yeah. So I know there was, a, there was a, a big lawsuit and I don't know if that ever got resolved that Ira Kurzban was heading up out of Miami, but yeah. um, I don't know if it's still going through the courts or, or what, but it, for some reason he was never too confident about it and I was never sure why. But hopefully, you know, legislative or regulatorily, it'll, it'll, get, it'll get addressed hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. I mean, it's it's a, such a controversial system. If you talk about it, take side. I mean, you get attacked by <laughs> on Twitter. <laughs> I've seen people get like just horrible <laughs> reviews being left on their on their offices and stuff. It's is interesting because in some sense it is really unfair, um, but the other sense, like all the other countries are going to be crowded out. One negative thing people say is, "Oh, immigration attorneys are doing this because want the same situation because they make more money on H one Bs." But they're like, "Well, we'll still make more money on perm and, 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 and adjustment of status." So it's really the, the money doesn't come into place there, really. Uh, but uh, yeah. it's such a nuanced thing because I don't have too many Indian and Chinese clients as more of the other countries, so they're going to be hit really hard, especially EB one category. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's on. It's just a it's a crazy situation the way it is. The ideal is just have 2 million green cards a year and take away from the derivatives. And that'll be a huge jump in the bulletin right there. That's right. So back, back to that, that point on EB-5. So as a result, the United States of America is only getting about, um, you know, 3000 yeah. investors instead of 10,000 investors. So another example of us, you know, shooting ourselves in the foot mm-hmm. could bring in a lot yeah. of free capital. Yeah. And uh, you know, it, a positive or negative thing is once you become a U.S. person, you're taxed on your global income. So it's like a huge boost to the tax base, too. So if the people are against it, they're not realizing these are multimillionaire billionaires that all of a sudden have their entire income taxable. <laughs> so it's like yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a huge game for the U.S., although a lot of them are from like countries that opaque uh, banking systems. So it's hard to find all that information. But uh, nonetheless, it's a huge boost uh, for coming. Mitch, thank you so much. It was a great pleasure speaking with you. You're welcome, John. Great uh, chatting with you too. And uh, I look, look, look forward to uh, once the pandemic is done to go out and have that uh, coffee with you. Look forward to it. Thanks okay. so much. Th- th- thanks, thanks, for the, thanks for the opportunity. Appreciate it. You got it. Thank you for listening to the Immigration Lawyers Podcast. The Immigration Lawyers Podcast is a part of the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox, a training and marketing program for immigration lawyers. For more information about that, please email us at info at immigrationlawyerstoolbox.com. Also, you can find more information and updates on the LinkedIn page for the Immigration Lawyers Toolbox, as well as a private Facebook group for practicing immigration lawyers. You can email me for information about that as well. And also the Twitter page is a great place for updates. Until next one, have a good one.